While Nixon's successes of the late 60s and early 70s marked the beginning of the end of the New Deal coalition, in 1980 it was in full-scale retreat. Filling the ideological vacuum was the new conservative coalition, which brought together moderate fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, and the religious right. An actor by profession, Ronald Reagan was blessed with amazing oratory skills. He had a sharp wit and a good sense of humor. His nickname was the Great Communicator. Reagan was a New Deal Democrat. He admired Franklin Roosevelt, describing him as a true hero. However, in the 1950s, Reagan began to adopt increasingly right-wing positions. For example, as the president of the Screen Actors Guild during the decade, Reagan gained a reputation for being a staunch anti-communist. Even though he backed Harry Truman in the late 40s, he supported Dwight D. Eisenhower for president in 1952 and 1956, and Richard Nixon in 1960. His shift rightward was confirmed in 1962 when he joined the Republican Party just as the cultural clashes surrounding the civil rights movement gripped America. From 1967 to 1975, Reagan was the Republican governor of California. He ran for president in 1976, but lost in the primary to Gerald Ford and secured the Republican nomination for the 1980 presidential election and trounced Jimmy Carter, whose presidency was hobbled by a weak economy and foreign policy crises. Reagan's electoral coalition included a wide range of different groups. He gained majorities in working class and lower middle class neighborhoods in the Northeast and Midwest. He won his own state of California and surrounding Western states, brought Southern Democrats on board, and preserved traditional Republican strongholds among the wealthy. But Reagan also introduced new political forces to the Republican Party, including the far right and religious fundamentalists. This meant that the modern Republican Party was in fact a loose coalition of moderate fiscal conservatives interested in economic reform and smaller government government in the center and a socially conservative fundamentalist Christian wing on the right. The problem with this coalition is that these two wings rarely agree with each other. On the one side, moderates are unwilling to embrace the social values and fervency of the religious right, while on the other, the religious right has been unwilling to embrace the materialism and consumerism of the moderates. Like Nixon, Reagan appealed to his base through the use of cultural warfare. He wanted to appeal to values voters who were upset with the direction that the United States had gone since the good old days of the 1950s. He wanted a return to the two-parent heterosexual nuclear family. He supported family values, was fiercely anti-abortion, and viewed homosexuality as a sin. He argued that while some American values had gone out of fashion, they were still important to many Americans. He encouraged localism and was suspicious of the role of government, telling his voters that he would, quote, get the government off the backs of Americans, end quote. This, of course, meant the end of the New Deal. And yet, throughout the 1980 campaign, Reagan also exuded a sense of optimism and confidence that could not be overlooked. He knew the U.S. had suffered considerably due to the social unrest of the 1960s, the trauma of the Vietnam War, and the economic dislocation caused during the 1970s. He vowed to, quote, make America great again, end quote. Yes, Trump stole this slogan from Reagan, to breathe a new life back into America, to redefine the American way of life, and to give a new sense of hope and confidence. In the 1980 election, Reagan trounced Carter, taking 50.7% of the popular vote and 489 electoral college votes to Carter's meager 49. The Republicans took control of the Senate for the first time since 1952, but the Democrats managed to retain control of the House. The following will examine the economic, social, and political history of the Reagan administration. Next lecture, we will look at Reagan's foreign policy, the end of the Cold War, and the emergence of the New World Order in the 1990s. As president, Reagan was a big believer in supply-side economics. The basic idea is that if you cut taxes on the wealthy in business, it will bring about economic growth because they would spend more money on buying products, which would create jobs and ultimately result in increased government revenue. In short, the idea is that the wealth given to the top will eventually, quote, trickle down to the poor. The application of this economic theory to the U.S. economic system has been known as Reaganomics. However, the economic orthodoxy was known as Keynesian economics, which held that during times of economic downturn, governments should borrow money and run deficits to spur economic growth and therefore economic recovery. This was how FDR pulled the U.S. economy out of the Great Depression and was further reinforced with the economic growth that resulted from the war economy. Reagan rejected this. However, two months into Reagan's presidency, a disturbed gunman, John Hinckley, tried to assassinate the president just outside the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. As he headed into security, Reagan joked with the surgeon, quote, I hope you're all Republicans, end quote, to which the surgeon, who was a liberal Democrat, said, quote, today we're, Mr. President, we're all Republicans, end quote. Another great story was that he told his wife, Nancy, that he, quote, forgot to duck, 
The assassination attempt led to a tremendous spike in Reagan's popularity, especially as anecdotes of his humor surrounding the incident spread. Reagan seized upon his popularity to push through tax reforms in Congress, leading to the passage of the Economic Recovery Tax Act, which cut taxes by 5% for a year and 10% for the following two years. As Keynesian economics had predicted, the tax cuts resulted in a 6% drop in government revenues, which in turn led to a ballooning national deficit. The interest rates shot up from an already high 12% to 20%, which pushed the economy back into a steep recession. It was immediately clear that the policy had backfired, so Reagan was forced to close the loopholes and raise taxes in September 1982 with the passage of the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. Supply-side economics appeared to have failed, but Reagan continued in his determination to cut taxes. In 1986, once the economy had stabilized, Reagan pushed through Congress the Tax Reform Act, which simplified the tax code, cut taxes, and closed many loopholes that wealthy individuals had used to avoid paying at the highest rate. It reduced the number of tax brackets from 15 to 4, dropped 6 million people off the tax roll, and gave every tax bracket a break. Once again, the tax cuts did not have the effect that Reagan had hoped for. Part of the problem was that Reagan's supply-side economics only tended to help the rich and, and super-rich segments of American society. For example, between 1980 and 1990, the wealthiest Americans saw an increase in their family incomes by 15.6%, while the middle class saw a 5.2% increase, and the poorest Americans saw a drop in their family incomes by 9.8%. Meanwhile, the number of impoverished Americans increased by nearly 8 million people, making the U.S. one of the richest, most impoverished countries in the world. The problem with Reaganomics was that it was combined with vast increases in military spending and huge cuts to social welfare programs, which left many Americans, especially minorities, worse off than before. Seeking to confront the Soviet Union abroad, Reagan more than doubled military spending between 1980 and 1989, from $134 billion to $300 billion, in an all-out effort to outspend the Soviet Union on military technology. At the same time, Reagan slashed spending on great society social welfare programs designed to combat poverty, leading to a 60% cut in federal assistance to local governments, reduced federal funding to Medicaid, food stamps, and education programs, froze the minimum wage at $3.35 an hour, and cut federal funding for public housing and rent subsidies. However, Reagan soon realized that seeking to cut popular programs like Medicare and Social Security were non-starters with the American public and backed away. Reagan was also firmly committed to deregulation, which sought to loosen federal oversight on industry, particularly on the question of environmental protection. This included opening up federal territories to oil exploration, forestry, and mining. The Environmental Protection Agency's budgets were severely reduced, and officials were ordered not to enforce the law. Always protective of big business, Reagan dismissed proposals aimed at reducing acid rain because he felt that this would inhibit economic growth. It was in the courts that Reagan sought to have his greatest impact. Throughout his presidency, Reagan appointed right-wing judges to federal positions, including the appointment of Antonin Scalia, Richard Kennedy, and Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court, 83 judges to the Courts of Appeal, and 290 judges to the District Courts. This would tilt the courts in a conservative direction for a generation. Like the previous decade, the 1980s was a period of intensive cultural conflicts over social issues. In particular, abortion served as a flashpoint between liberals who supported a woman's right to choose and conservatives who were adamantly opposed to abortion entirely, though some agreed that it was acceptable only during instances of incest and or rape. The source of the debate was a 1973 Supreme Court ruling in Roe v. Wade, which held that the right to privacy extended to a woman's decision to have an abortion and limited this procedure to the first and second trimesters. Religious conservatives were outraged and tried time and again to overturn the ruling but failed even as Reagan appointed conservative judges ruled against them. Another area of debate was the issue of homosexuality. Throughout the 1980s, the Reagan administration refused to take actions to stem the spread of HIV AIDS. AIDS was first identified in 1981, where the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, noticed that a retrovirus was compromising the immune systems of gay men and intravenous drug users, at least 75% of the victims being gay men. The Reagan administration was slow to respond to the crisis, largely because of Reagan's own view that homosexuality was a, quote, alternative lifestyle, end quote, that could not be condoned. To some on the religious right, the gay community appeared to be getting what they deserved. A key champion of anti-gay bigotry was Jerry Falwell, the founder of Liberty University, who once said, quote, AIDS is not just God's punishment for homosexuals. It is God's punishment for this society that tolerates homosexuals, end quote. 
Reagan first mentioned the existence of AIDS in 1985 when he expressed skepticism about whether to allow children afflicted with the disease to attend school, despite the CDC saying that there was no reason for alarm. It was not until 1987 that Reagan acknowledged the crisis gripping America. By that time, 21,000 Americans had died of AIDS, including one of his friends, Rock Hudson. And even then, he prevented the Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop, from speaking out about the growing crisis. This forced Koop to make an end run around the White House when his office mailed out information about HIV-AIDS to every U.S. household that recommended the use of condoms to prevent the spread of the disease. The White House was outraged. Two years later, nearly 100,000 Americans had died of AIDS including my wife's uncle. When Reagan entered office in 1981, he inherited a series of significant crises from the Carter administration. Reagan vowed to adopt an aggressive foreign policy aimed at scaling back communism throughout the world, which led to several interventions in South Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America, which would eventually come back to haunt the U.S. In December 1979, a year before Reagan entered office, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, which had been beset with political instability. The Soviet invasion was a watershed event in the Cold War, marking the first time the Soviet Union had invaded a country outside the Eastern Bloc. In response, President Carter wrote a sharply worded letter to Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev denouncing his aggression, and during the State of Union address, he announced his own doctrine vowing to protect the Middle East oil supplies from encroaching Soviet power. The administration also enacted economic sanctions and trade embargoes against the Soviet Union, called for a boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics, and stepped up its aid to the Afghan insurgents. During the Reagan administration, the U.S. increased its assistance to the Afghan resistance via Pakistan in what was known as Operation Cyclone. This operation became one of the CIA's longest and most expensive covert operations ever undertaken. Funding began with about 20 to $30 million per year in 1980 and rose to $630 million per year in 1987. Much of the increased funding in the mid-1980s was in the form of advanced weaponry like Stinger anti-aircraft missiles in large numbers beginning in 1986. This struck a decisive blow to the Soviet war effort as it allowed the lightly armed Afghans to effectively defend against Soviet helicopter landings in strategic areas. Throughout the war, the Soviet government had continuously denied that the conflict was even taking place, even though Soviet troops were being killed in high numbers. However, with the coming to power of a more moderate Soviet leadership under Mikhail Gorbachev, the government began to acknowledge that the war was occurring and pushed forward with its efforts to extricate itself. When the Soviets withdrew in February 1989, the US-backed Mujahideen could rightly claim victory over the Soviet superpower and that it contributed to its collapse in 1991. This gave the jihadist movement a newfound sense of confidence that it could defeat a superpower. Another major issue Reagan faced upon entering office was the Iran-Iraq War, which began in September 1980 when Iraq invaded Iran, which was right in the middle of a revolution and a major confrontation with the United States over the hostage crisis, where 52 diplomats were held for 444 days. The U.S. policy towards the war was technically strict neutrality, whereby it took no sides in the war, refused to sell arms to either belligerent, and actively worked to bring the war to a close. While this may have been the case during the Carter administration, it was certainly not the case during the Reagan administration, which from June 1982 onwards tilted heavily towards Iraq, providing it with tactical intelligence, diplomatic cover, and economic assistance, all while Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iran on an almost daily basis starting in August 1983. There's a perfectly good explanation for this. After Iraq's initial invasion into Iran, it became bogged down and the Iranians were able to regroup and bring back some of the more talented military commanders under the Shah. By June 1982, the Iranians had expelled the Iraqis from their territory and had amassed some 300,000 troops outside Basra and just miles from not just Iraq's main oil producing region, but Kuwait and Saudi Arabia's as well. From an American perspective, a successful Iranian breakthrough at Basra could give Iran a stranglehold on the global oil market and potentially bring the United States and its allies to their knees. This was an unacceptable outcome. Another problem was that once Iran had gained the upper hand in the war, it showed no interest whatsoever in a negotiated settlement. The only acceptable outcome was Saddam Hussein stepping down from power and billions of dollars in reparations. During the course of my research into the war, I heard a story, and it may be apocryphal, but in June 1982, right around the time when Iran was about to invade Iraq, a member of Iraq's Revolutionary Command Council suggested that perhaps Saddam should step down and end the war, and was promptly taken into the next room and executed. So from this, I think it's safe to assume that Saddam stepping down was a non-starter. Beyond its efforts to quietly help Iraq, the Reagan administration tried to keep the Iran-Iraq war at a distance. After all, two terrible regimes bleeding each other dry wasn't the worst thing that could happen. 
However, the Reagan administration was drawn into the conflict in the mid-1980s when Iranian-backed militias in Lebanon began kidnapping American citizens, including the CIA station chief, William Buckley. When Reagan ordered U.S. troops to Lebanon as peacekeepers, a terrorist drove a truck packed with explosives into the Marine Barracks compound in Beirut and detonated it, killing 241. Reagan was forced to withdraw American forces, but continued to be obsessed with obtaining the release of the hostages. In 1985, an opportunity to bring about the release of the hostages presented itself at the exact time when White House officials had been growing concerned about Ayatollah Khomeini's deteriorating health and their lack of influence in Tehran. This led to the White House agreeing to participate in an Israeli initiative that sought to sell American arms to Iran in exchange for the release of the hostages. This culminated in U.S. officials traveling in secret to Tehran in 19. 19- However, in November 1985, a Lebanese newspaper with ties to hardliners in the Iranian regime who were opposed to the deal exposed the Tehran mission. And as investigators dug into the mess, it was discovered that senior White House officials had been redirecting the profits of the arms sales to Iran to finance a right-wing militia in Nicaragua known as the Contras, which Congress had explicitly prohibited with the passage of the Boland Amendment in 1982. The Iran-Contra affair is considered one of the greatest political scandals in modern American history. When the United States' regional allies, but especially Iraq, learned that it had sold weapons to Iran, they were understandably outraged. For example, in 1987, Iraq bombed the USS Stark, killing 37 sailors, and Kuwait used the incident to force the U.S. to reflag several of its oil tankers and establish a convoy system in the Gulf, known as Operation Earnest Will, to protect them against Iranian mines and anti-ship missiles. This, in turn, led to several minor and major skirmishes with the Iranian Navy and Revolutionary Guards, culminating in the shooting down of an Iranian passenger plane in July 1988, killing all 290 on board. Despite the Reagan administration insisting that this horrific incident was an accident, Iran tried to take the matter to the UN Security Council but found no one was interested in helping them so long as the war continued. On July 20, 1988, Ayatollah Khomeini announced that he had accepted a ceasefire in the war, but Iraq pressed on with its offensive until August 20th when the war officially came to an end. Reagan's foreign policy was arguably the most aggressive in Central America, a region beset with a distinctly anti-American flavor throughout the 1980s. The conflict centered on Nicaragua. Nicaragua, which the right-wing Somoza family had ruled since 1937 and was overthrown in a leftist revolution in July 1979, and El Salvador, which experienced a moderate coup in October 1979 that displaced the power of the entrenched elite. The situation in El Salvador quickly deteriorated as the elites organized right-wing death squads which terrorized the population and assassinated moderates and radicals. Leftists responded to the violence with the creation of the Farabundo Marti Front for National Liberation or the FMLN, which the U.S. viewed as a communist front. In 1980, government troops were implicated in the rape of four American nuns, after which it proved incapable of responding to the violence. When Reagan came to office, he increased American military aid to the Salvadorian government, but Congress demanded that the White House certify that the assistance would not be used to violate human rights. For the next decade, government forces and mercenary death squads slaughtered some 75,000 civilians, while U.S. military advisors looked on. The Reagan administration spent some $4.5 billion fighting the insurgency in El Salvador. In Nicaragua, a leftist nationalist group known as the Sandinistas overthrew the Somoza government government in July 1979. Upon seizing power, Cuba sent thousands of medical specialists and teachers to Nicaragua to help the country rebuild after decades of corruption and purchased weaponry from the Soviet Union, all of which were cause for concern in Washington. In 1981, Reagan ordered the CIA to train and arm a mercenary army of about 15,000 anti-Santanista soldiers known as the Contras. However, Congress soon learned that the Contras were responsible for horrific human rights abuses and massacres. This prompted the passage of the Bolin Amendment, which barred the U.S. from supporting the Contras. In 1984, Congress discovered that the CIA had worked with the Contras to mine Nicaraguan ports, which was a violation of not just the Bolin Amendment, but international law. This prompted Congress to pass additional legislation barring any American assistance to the Contras. Reagan ignored the ban, telling his advisors to, quote, do whatever you have to do to help these people keep body and soul together, end quote. This prompted White House officials to solicit support from foreign governments in aid of the Contras and eventually led to the Iran-Contra scandal.
In early 1985, Reagan admitted that his government had been trying to overthrow the Sandinista government and then announced the implementation of an economic embargo, combined with blocking a much-needed World Bank loan to the Nicaraguan government. Then, in October 1986, Sandinista forces shot down a CIA plane that was attempting to drop supplies to Contra guerrillas. A month later, the Iran Arms for Hostage scandal broke, and it was soon learned that a White House official, Colonel Oliver North, had inflated the price of the arms sold to Iran and diverted the profits roughly $18 million, to a Swiss bank account, which was then used to finance the Contras. The CIA operation to support the Contras came to a crashing halt. Some 30,000 Nicaraguans died in the Civil War. The Iran-Contra scandal threatened the survival of Reagan's presidency. He ordered the creation of a Blue Ribbon Commission to investigate the affair, but the, quote, Teflon president, end quote, was able to escape the crisis relatively unscathed. At this point, Reagan was already experiencing the onset of Alzheimer's disease, which affected his memory. As a result, when questioned about the scandal, Reagan said, quote, there was an awful lot going on, and it's awfully easy to be a little short of memory, end quote. He nevertheless held a televised address in January 1987, where he took full responsibility for his actions and those who worked for him. First, let me say I take full responsibility for my own actions and for those of my administration. As angry as I may be about activities undertaken without my knowledge, I am still accountable for those activities. As disappointed as I may be in some who served me, I am still the one who must answer to the American people for this behavior. The Reagan administration did not survive the scandal intact. In total, six top Reagan administration officials were indicted, including Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, National Security Advisors Robert McFarlane and John Point Dexter, and Assistant Secretary of State Elliot Abrams, in addition to two top CIA officials. George H.W. Bush subsequently pardoned them. Colonel North was convicted of accepting an illegal gratuity, obstruction of a congressional inquiry, and destruction of documents, but it was overturned on appeal because his testimony before Congress was used against him even though he had been granted immunity in exchange for testifying. In the next lecture, I will discuss the Cold War Endgame.